Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Mary Cromack. Mary is a kitten foster home that specializes in neonatal orphans or bottle babies, and she is with a group starting up that's called Foster Purrs. Mary, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. So I think that today's show is going to be really interesting because at this point in time, you aren't specifically affiliated with a nonprofit. You are working as an individual foster home, um, working with bottle babies. And so uh, today's show is going to be interesting because there's so many people out there that are working so hard to save cats, save kittens, do TNR, and they're doing it all on their own and not with the backing of a 501c3 organization. They're doing it just for the cats. And so I think that some of the things that we may talk about today may be very applicable to many of the folks that listen to this show. So thank you again for being willing to share your story and chat with us. Mary, can you first tell me a little bit about how you got started? Growing up, basically, I was just always a cat person. In my family, we always had at least one or two cats. And I struggled with depression and anxiety from a really young age. And cats, they just helped me. They calmed me down and always made me smile when I was upset. As I got older, it grew even more. And I ended up learning about how shelters are so overpopulated because of people not spaying and neutering, etc. And so as a result, they had to just euthanize so many innocent lives. And I did some more research, found some rescue organizations in my area and started fostering kittens. (laughs) That process started how long ago? It was about 10 years now. I started out fostering kittens that could eat on their own. And then I ended up realizing again, that an even bigger need was bottle feeding or neonates. So I watched as many videos as I could, did as much research as I could that by the time two little one week old kittens came into a local shelter, I really just totally felt confident in being able to save them. Tell me a little bit about your experience the first time you had bottle babies and what that was like and also what your challenges are working with those bottle babies. The first two bottle babies that I had were luckily super easy. They latched onto their little syringe and the nipple right away. They didn't really have many health problems. So I got a pretty good introduction, an easy one. But of course, with orphans, especially if they haven't gotten to nurse on their mom for a day or two, they don't have that colostrum, which is the immunity that they get from their mom. So a lot of them come to us really weak with a lot of health problems. And that is really a challenge because as tiny and as fragile as they are, you have to act quick. As soon as you notice something odd, something going downhill, at the snap of a finger, they can be gone. So you need to act quickly. But it is just the most rewarding, absolutely most rewarding thing, I think, in the fostering because they really do look to you as their mom. You really see them grow up and become healthy, happy little silly kitties. (laughs) Are there specific supplies that you recommend? You're talking about syringes. And if someone is interested in becoming a bottle baby foster home, what sort of supplies would you have? And we also talked a little bit before we hit the record button about how different sheltering organizations or other 501c3 organizations treat their foster homes very differently. One organization may offer something and another organization may not. Share with us what you think an organization really should provide a foster home. Some of the main things that bottle baby fostering you would need, of course, is the kitten formula. In my opinion, I like Breeder's Edge or goat's milk. The kittens seem to like the way that tastes better. It's a little sweeter than the typical KMR, and they have a lot less gastro issues with it. 
miracle nipples instead of just the regular nipples that come on the bottle. They come pre-holed so you don't have to cut the little hole. It has like a really perfect amount of flow for the kitten and it helps kittens that are having a hard time latching they just almost automatically latch with these little miracle nipples and syringes, like three milliliter syringes for the tiny ones. I like to start them out on the syringes so I can more control the flow and control exactly how much they're getting. And then they graduate to the bottle. <laughs> Need to have like medicines on hand. Rescues normally will provide the medicines and bedding. And some rescues will provide the food and the litter in the crates, but it's not often that all of that is provided. And I believe that the 501c3 should fully support their fosters. And that's why I'm going to be starting my own and provide food, litter, crates, any odds and ends, and of course, the medicines and the vetting. I think that would help get more foster homes because foster homes are always in such a huge need because partly people are having to spend out of their own pocket to even foster with a nonprofit organization. You know, many people can have the heart, but don't really have the financial means to do that. So if a nonprofit were to cover totally everything, then I believe that we could have more people willing to foster and save lives. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point that it's really helpful for any foster home to know that the organization has your back to make sure that you've got everything covered. Um, when you are providing a warm area for the kittens, do you use like a disc that you microwave yeah. to heat up or your heating pad or anything like that? Yes, they need to be on a heat source. They cannot control like their own temperature until they are at least like four or five weeks. But even then, I still leave a little heat source in there. But you have to make sure that they have room to get off the heat source if they want to. So even when they are little tiny babies, they are able to squirm and move maneuver themselves towards and away from heat, which is what they do with their mother. So a snuggle safe disc is really ideal. You put that in the microwave and it stays warm for like eight hours. Also, just a regular heating pad on the low setting wrapped in a fuzzy blanket don't ever put them directly on the heating pad. Those are major things and don't ever feed a kitten when it is cold. So if you find a kitten, don't try to feed it right away. Make sure it is warm first because they cannot digest the food if they are cold. So being warm is a major thing. Warm, fed, and potty. <laughs> <laughs> what about when kittens come in with fleas? With the bottle babies, you can't use traditional flea treatments. So actually, everyone suggests like, you know, the Blue Dawn to give them a bath with the Blue Dawn dish soap. I don't really like to do that right away with really fragile babies because they can go in shock from getting it the cold water, even if you warm them up right away. If they are that fragile, it's risky. So I luckily had a vet tell me that frontline spray can be used on these little neonates. And that has been a lifesaver for me. You just spray the frontline on a gloved hand and rub it along their body. Make sure you get down to their skin and it, the fleas die right away. And that's much easier than exposing them to the cold water at first. And then once they're in in your care for a few days and are more stable and healthy, then you can give them a bath. What has been the most challenging situation that you've had with bottle babies? I know that it's devastating for some foster homes when a bottle baby doesn't make it. Is that really the greatest challenge or are there other challenges that you can think of? I do believe that that is the greatest challenge. Even when you have a sick baby, that almost motivates me more. And I just dive fully even more into it to do all that I can. And a lot of times they do pull through if you act quickly and do as much supportive care as you can. I have lost a few bottle babies and one specifically just stays in my mind because I saw his pain as he was passing and it just still breaks my heart to this day. That's definitely the hardest part, but you just remind yourself that if you hadn't tried and you hadn't have given them that chance, they would have been even worse off and they would have been passing alone, cold. At least you are giving them some love before. Are you struggling to increase positive outcomes in your shelter? Are you overwhelmed with high stray intake and low owner reclaim? 
Do you wish you had solutions to your biggest problems? The Path Ahead provides in-person and remote consulting for animal welfare organizations. Let us help you to increase life-saving by engaging your community and maintaining the human-animal bond. The Path Ahead teaches proven best practices for humane, effective animal welfare, including community cat management, missing pet prevention and recovery, and progressive adoptions. By identifying and addressing outdated and unproductive practices, you can reduce intake and length of stay and keep animals in their loving homes where they belong. Leave the past behind and take the path ahead to success. Visit our website at www.animalwelfaresuccess.com. So we were talking a little bit about TNR and a hot topic usually around this time of year and to the summer months is folks finding young kittens and picking them up and bringing them in that are, you know, found out in a shed or something like that or under a deck. What are your thoughts to how we can educate the public with regards to community cats out there, mom cats that have their kittens out there and may not be in our best interest to scoop everybody up and bring them into the shelter? Education is definitely key with everything, spaying, neutering, keeping pets outdoors, then with this situation as well. And I think now in the age of social media, it really helps to kind of just push all these things out on social media to be able to reach people that you typically wouldn't be able to reach. You know, people that wouldn't look up a rescue organization or look up this info on themselves and kind of just have it in front of their face. So they have to see it. And definitely when you see these little kittens, if you see them by themselves, unless it is an urgent, dire situation, like they're in the middle of the road or there's a coyote right there or something, don't pick them up right away. You know, back off and watch from afar because mom, she can't stay there 24-7. She has to go hunt to get food. She is leaving her kittens in what she thinks is a safe place. Then here come people, you know, they think they are doing a good thing. They really do. And they pick them up and then mom comes back and her babies are gone. So just watch from afar and you can kind of tell, just look at the kittens. If they're sleeping, they are probably okay. If they are crying their heads off, still watch for a couple hours. And if they just keep crying, then they are probably hungry and their mom likely has not been back. But sleeping kittens mean normally that they are full and okay. So how long would you give it? Like five or six hours or even longer than that? Um, At least six hours if they are in a safe place and they aren't crying. Mm -hmm. It's a really good guideline. I think the important thing is having a guideline to be able to understand when the kittens would need assistance. One thing I wanted to touch base with you on is you've been doing a lot of this on your own, fostering with other organizations. You foster bottle babies and you also mentioned you do some trap new to return. How do you balance all of this? Does it get overwhelming to you? It does, honestly, especially right now during kitten season. But the reward versus the overwhelmingness that you feel at the time, it just completely cancels it out. The reward is just so much bigger. You know you're saving these lives. And then when we adopt them out, a lot of the adopters, they send us updates. You know, we love that. We love to see the little kitties that we have raised grown up enjoying their forever homes. Do you want to share with us a little bit more about your thoughts for foster purrs? Yes, I am in the process of getting my 501c3 and I am hoping to grow my following. Of course, the more of a following you have, the more donations you can receive and the more live and save. I can save as many as I can currently with out-of-pocket stuff, but there's not many rescues in the area that focus on neonatals. So I want to take that into focus and make a somewhat of a nursery and make sure that I have fosters that are able to bottle feed. I will do orientations on fostering. So I will teach people how to bottle feed if they would like. It's really quite easy, especially if you have someone there with you teaching you hands on, which I didn't even have. And, you know, I picked it up right away. So it just makes it even easier if you have someone there to fully support you, which is what I plan to do with my 501c3. I hope to get other really motivated individuals to help me with more like board issues once I grow. 
and I just want to save lives and fully support the fosters <laughs> so that, you know, more people are willing. I think that's great. And the one thing that it sounds like you're really willing to focus is on a specific niche area. So you're not trying to be all things to all cats and all people. You really are understanding what resources you can provide and then really specialize in that one niche area, which is fantastic. And you've identified that as a need in your community that isn't currently being served. So I think that's a really important takeaway for folks to have when they're thinking about their own programs in communities is what is it that isn't being provided, see where you can create your programs around that specific need. One last question with regards to trap, neuter, return and being out in the community. If you saw a stray cat on the street, what would you do? Well, first I try and see if I can get it to come to me without craziness like trapping. (laughs) I have had that happen once. Uh, I saw a new cat come into this colony that I had been TNRing and sights of him for a few days and then I was there and saw him kind of run around behind this little shed area. So I kind of just slowly walked over there and, you know, put my hand out and made the little kitty kiss noises and he came right Mm. up to me. (laughs) So I then yanked him up and got him fixed and actually it ended up adopting him out. Him so friendly, but whenever I see a cat in need, I just leave it. <laughs> Any cat that's out, I feel that it is in need because unless they are TNR'd, which you can't check until you catch them anyway, unless they have the ear tip, but I would always catch them first just to check them over and make sure everything's good to go and then let them go in a safe place if they are feral or If they're friendly, then I will find them a home or find which home had them and either they escaped or try and educate them on not letting their cat out. (laughs) So Mary, if folks are interested in finding out more about the work that you're doing, how could they find you? I am on Facebook and Instagram at Foster Purrs. And then is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? So I do have a PayPal, a Venmo, and an Amazon wish list all set up. They are linked from my Facebook and my Instagram. The Amazon wish list is ideal right now. I have 17 foster kittens at my house right now. Um, oh, wow. We are going through about a 24 pack of three ounce cans of Tiny Tiger cat canned food from Chewy. Quite a bit. They're eating me out the house, but they're (laughs) growing really well. My little bottle babies actually just learned how to eat food. So I'm waiting for my next bottle babes to come in. (laughs) Got a lot, lot of kittens going on in that house. So, and it sounds like they're in great hands. Um, Over the last 10 years, it's fantastic to hear about the stories. I know that there are a lot of challenges with the process. Um, You know, we didn't discuss much about adoption, but it sounds like you must be adopting them out because you seem to still be taking them in. (laughs) So um, there's challenges with that too, but you sound like you're pretty comfortable with that. Yes. We adopt out to like the Northern States with transport and everything. Well, Mary, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show. And then I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Maybe once you have your 501c3 set up, we can find out what life is like as a nonprofit versus being an individual rescuer out there. Yes, that would be great. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 